Yelixa, eh, si quieres vamos a comenzar para no tomar mucho tiempo. Me avisa cuando estemos. Gracias. Ok. Good, good afternoon for those in the eh, East Coast and good morning for those in the West Coast. I think it's still morning there. So welcome eh, my, for those who doesn't know me. My name is Juvelkis Montalvo. I'm the head executive director. It's uh, I am delighted to have you here. Thank you for your time and accepting this invitation. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be talking about what's new in the accreditation mm -hmm. after July 1st, 2020. We truly appreciate, again, your time and, and support for, uh, for to the Heads Initiatives as we are here to serve you. Definitely, this is our goal. Today, we have more than 150 participants that register and receive the link to connect. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are about 50, and we hope that the others can join us very soon. Uh, we have uh, uh, participants from institutions in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, in the United mm -hmm. States, in different states in the United States, and also international institutions and schools in countries such as Dominican Republic and Mexico. Saludos, welcome all. Greeting uh, again to all, and we hope that these webinars will be of great benefit to everyone. We would like to recognize and emphasize that this webinar was coordinated with the support of our new uh, recently elected chair, chairman of the Heads Board of Directors, Dr. Carlos Morales, who is here with us today. He, uh, he is not only head chairman, but the president of the TCC Connect campus of Tarrant County College in Texas. As you may know, his commitment is to support and serve our more than 40 member institutions in Puerto Rico, Latin America, and in the United States. And, and also, with this in mind, we invited Dr. Hilda Colon, former Vice President from Middle States Commission of Higher Education, to be a presenter today of this important topic uh, for all institutions. Before we begin today's topic, we invite you to use the chat, since it's already activated, for your questions on, or any doubts, and uh, as our interest is to clarify your doubts and uh, about this topic. We ask you to keep your microphones mute to avoid any interruptions uh, or to avoid interruptions excuse me as the webinar is being recorded for uh, everyone uh, also for you as a reference and from others that could not join us uh, live today the recording can be found by monday probably uh no later than monday on the same page uh, you register for this uh, uh webinar Okay, and we also remind you that in the next event section of our website, heads.org, you can find all the topics that will be offered during this semester. This is the second one. Remember that this semester we have a combination of English and Spanish webinars uh, again, so that you can separate. Please check the dates, check the topics that you are interested in participate, so you can research that in your agenda. Our next uh, webinar will be in Spanish and will be about distance learning. And we will it will be in August, uh, Friday, August 28th, 3 p.m. Eastern Time again. And this will be presented by Dr. Juan uh, Tito Melendez, that we already know in Puerto Rico uh, as Tito Melendez. And he's from University of Puerto Rico, uh, Rio Piedra Campus. Okay. Finally, participants who are interested in evidence of their participation heads granted a participation certificates. You only need to send an email to info at heads.org in a period no more uh, 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 no more than seven days after today. So from today to the next Friday, we are accepting mm. emails to prepare the email. I mean the certificate. Sorry. And as soon as we have all the emails, then we will prepare the certificate to send, uh, send it to everyone uh, who requested. Also, this semester, we have an alliance with the uh, Continuing Ed Office of Inter-American University, and they uh, are also willing to grant it a Continuing Ed certificate. Uh, 
uh, for a, a cost of five dollars per certificate per webinar and all the uh, instructions to pay for this certificate directly to them and also to receive the certificate are on the website below the registration uh, site that you well not that you enter your information if you have any doubts don't hesitate to contact us now we are ready to start our webinar and we are pleased to present Dr. Carlos Morales, head chair, uh, who will moderate this webinar and present our uh, guest speaker today. So go ahead, Dr. Morales. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Jubel Keys, for uh, the opportunity. And I want to uh, say hello to everybody and thank you for, for the attendance. I want to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Ilda Colon Plumey, and a short bio about her is that from 1972 to 2009, she was a member of the faculty in the Department of Biology at the University of Puerto Rico, Umacao. She also shared, served as chancellor of uh, UPR, Umacao, for uh, or from 2002 through 2009. In 2010, she joined the staff of Ana Jimenez University System in Puerto Rico, serving as special assistant to the system president uh, from 10 to 12 and later as associate vice president of the system from 2012 to 2017. From 2013 to 2017 she also served as co-principal investigator and education and public outreach deputy director for the Puerto Rico Arecibo Observatory. In addition Dr. Colon has served as an evaluation team member and team chair on behalf of Middle State Commission on Higher Education. Dr. Colon uh, served as liaison to variety of institutions through the Middle State region until her uh, retirement a couple of weeks ago, July 31st of 2020. With that said, I want to pass the microphone and the stage to Dr. Colon. Thank you, Dr. Morales. Thank you, um, Jubelkis. And thank you all who joined us this afternoon. I really appreciate you being there. I hope I can answer some of your questions and, and we're going to be starting. Immediately. The last one was several years ago and it's over two. But um, there has been situation, there have a recent situations in which um, the co Congress has not reached consensus on the on the renewal of that higher authorization higher education authorization act. That's the cost or that cost that throughout these past years there has been a, there have been several occasions in which the the mechanism of negotiated rulemaking has been put in place just to update what's in the in the in the law for general for higher education institutions in the United States. So in this case, we're going to be talking about the last iteration of the negotiated rulemaking that took effect. This has derived in procedural changes for the institutions within the United States. I really appreciate our colleagues from Mexico and from the Dominican Republic. I want to share this information with all of you, though it's going to be impacting directly whichever institution you are from in the United States, Puerto Rico, or the U.S. Virgin Islands. This is just a disclaimer because this is my responsibility. If I make mistakes, it's not middle states making mistakes, it's me. I just retired three weeks ago, uh, July 31st. And the reason that I'm gonna be using probably middle states as my focus is because that's my, my, my experience, really. I hope it still serves. Okay, my objectives are to try to, 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 to share with you some of these regulatory changes that were introduced after July 1st identifies how the way in which some of them uh, impact the accreditation processes. And then if we have time, exemplify how it shows, for example, in the Mill States website, especially because it affects directly the substantive change process. 
um, there were some factors that I'm calling here environmental factors that prompted those changes. First of all, is the congressional revision that has not been able to happen, but yet the regulatory uh, mandates have been revised through the negotiated rulemaking. So these are the ones that were approved back in 2019, November, specifically November of 2019. eight weeks ago or seven weeks ago. But there were also some regulations that had to be revised only because of something that nobody ever expected, and that was COVID-19. COVID-19 took us the world, took the world by surprise, and we're still dealing with the surprise. And uh, it prompted flexibilities that had to be introduced even after the revision caused by the negotiated rulemaking and then there are also factors that prompt all of these changes and will be affected by the internal aspects of universities and states con concerning institutions and states, for, like for example, finances that have been impacted, mergers, probably rise, acquisitions, closures, even opening of new markets. So there's gonna be there are gonna be several different environmental factors even though those didn't impact directly the negotiated rulemaking, but they have all they have all taken effect and are being considered at the same time. So it's it was serendipitous, but nonetheless it caused effects. Okay, the negotiated rulemaking process was started by the U.S. Department of Education in the spring and in the spring of 2019, after several months of working at the group that the USD convened, which was representative of across the nation and across institutions. They reached a consensus in spring of 2019 that those rules were published in a temporary basis on the CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, and presented to the public for, for consideration and until the Hilda, de momento como que se no se escucha. We can hear you very well. If you can, eh, really? Sí. Bueno, now we can hear you. Es que sometimes like the like the sounds like fails. Okay. Okay. Como que se va. Okay. Pero continue. Pero and you're talking okay. very fast. Okay. So, so slowly too. Okay. Thank you. Slowly. Okay. So in November 2019, those, that, those recommendations were then considered final in terms of public, public intervention. They, it went to the U.S. Department of Education. They revised those recommendations, and the final document was produced and published in the CFR for July 1st implementation. I'm going fast through this because this is going to be, this is, these are facts that you're going to have. What was important in terms of first of all, very, very important. There are no reference uh, references anymore to regional accreditation. The word regional disappeared from the code in after the July first rules. So, I mean, it opened the accreditation arena throughout the whole United States in the same way for everybody. Arbitration, which is the process in which, by which you would um, try to avoid legal actions, now is mandatory. Whereas before, institutions that thought they could go to the court directly and start working on it. But, um, but then now arbitration is really mandatory. And there are all of, there were several other processes and procedures that were, that were in, installed within the, within the law 
because they, they, they're supposed to increase student participation, student protection, institutional protection, and gave a big, big space for um, alternative methods for teaching, specifically remote learning. Este, uh, Hilda, excuse me, uh, some, some in the chat cannot hear you well. And there are suggestions if you can turn off your video so the, probably the sound, I mean, your stop sharing your, uh -huh, because probably now the sound sounds better because it's like for moments that like, we cannot hear you very well. So check that it out. Like, good. okay, no problem. But we, we are, okay. uh, it sounds good. Okay, now go ahead. So. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the recommendation. I'm sorry about that. So after all, uh, the US allowed accreditors and states also to take uh, emergency actions, especially after COVID. So that was the regular revision originally by the negotiated rulemaking, but then after COVID-19 started back in March, April, and even the beginning of June, there were several iterations of documents through which the Department of Education tried to reach the different institutions to make possible that several, most, some of those that were not approved, especially for distance learning, could maintain their teaching status and their higher education status, giving flexibilities in terms of being accredited or being allowed to conduct teaching that way through a different through different mechanisms. And we all benefited from that. All many, many institutions benefited from that. In fact, the provision for temporary approval of distance ed under this consideration of COVID-19 extends until December 31st of this year of 2020. If any of your institutions, the institutions that you represent, is not approved but for, for distance ed after January 1st of 2021, you might be in trouble unless there is another extension of this flexibility period. So my recommendation is any if, if there's any institution that's not approved yet for distance ed, please try to submit your proposal for a sub change for a program so that you can be allowed to teach that way without problems should anything happen after January 1st of 2021. So there were temporary waivers and procedures such as the sub, sub change for distance ed. And now institutions wishing to extend that education beyond December 31st of this year now must obtain approval. Whereas before it was extended, simply was granted, was given a temporary permit, but not anymore after this, not anymore at this time today as of December 31st of 2020. There were also temporary waivers for the visits. Remember that in accreditation, <clears throat> visits, team visits are very common throughout all the processes of accreditation. And those team visits are coveted by institutions and by our evaluators because they can get in relation, direct relationship with the institutions that they're visiting. In the during this time of COVID-19 and only because of COVID-19, so this is also very temporary. Virtual visits were allowed instead of some of the regular on-site visits and evaluation visits and follow-ups and, and several others have been conducted that way. Will that say that's something that I don't know because it's it was something prompted only by the COVID-19 situation. The language also that was included in this regulatory changes sometimes allows institutions to do things and commissions to do things that before were not allowed to do. They were not allowed to do. When I refer to the different commissions in the in the United States. This is a map, this belongs to middle states. This is middle states copyrighted. It's a map in which by color, you can see the different, the seven different regional accreditors that were, that still work, but are 
do not have to abide by the word regional anymore after June 30, 2020. The regions exist because you cannot erase states, you cannot erase boundaries, so they are still out there. Everybody's out there. Middle states region is the dark blue on the, on the upper right-hand uh, side of your screen. And, uh, but still, the word regional doesn't appear anymore. So theoretically, it's just one country for anybody to accredit anywhere. Okay. There were also some changes that all of these changes were introduced into the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, and they allowed, for example, this, this issue that I just mentioned, the term regional disappearing, that each commission then has the capacity to act according to their own bylaws and to their own mandates. And I want to specify here that this is interesting because though we have, I, we have divided the country artificially into seven previously into seven regional accreditors. In reality, each one of us, each one of those accreditors crossed boundaries because the institutions expand and take action anywhere in the United States. And the best example, the best example I know and I can use is Middle States currently operates in its own, in the region comprises New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I think I'm missing somebody in New Jersey, maybe. And right now, when we counted all of this, we said, but we're operating really, before I, before I, I resigned, we were operating in 48 states. And, and then of the 50 and in more than 90 countries, because the institutions in those, even so the main institution was located in those in those states. They expanded and opened branch campuses or additional locations anywhere in the states or internationally. And some we uh, middle states also has international institutions, much the same way that SACS does. I know that we have representatives here from SACS. If our president is from SACS, our chairperson and also people from probably from California. So from the West, on the Western sides, they have also international institutions that have asked for accreditation. This is an issue that's really important that came up as a consequence of the, of the revision by the negotiated rulemaking. Institutions that went in non-compliance for any reason, the, the law, the act gave them two years, previously gave them two years a period of two years after they were placed in non-compliance, that would be probation, warning, or even show cause, which is terrible. They had a period of two years to remove, to solve the situation, send reports, receive visits, and show that they were, they should keep their accreditation. But after this revision came up, and this is for any institution in the United States, after this revision came up, the, the new regulation extends this period over, over those two years, much longer than those two years. So now they can, they can uh, each commission determines how much longer. The law states up to four directly. In the case of middle states, it's granting three. And then there's alternative uh, mechanisms for the for extensions after that. That really benefits institutions because I thought I mean two years is really a short period to solve a probation or a warning situation. Also, options for that want to be included into. from these institutions that, after all, are new and want to become part of any uh, accredited institution. Substantive change is probably the core of the, of the changes that any commission receives, because this is the way that institutions keep innovating and, and keep improving themselves. 
The most significant changes under new regulations are those for sub change to me. This is really a new focus. The new focus says, okay, you will operate on, on risk based. So you can adopt and adapt um, regulations to, to try and approve innovations that previously you would hesitate to approve. You can approve them risk based and then decide how you're going to be working with those. So that's the model that bigger. Oh my God, I see the chat. So I'm sorry. If I'm going to connect by the cell, which number should I dial? Okay. So I mean, this is important. I, I, I'm sorry that I'm bit, all of this is basically in the slides. This, the model is based on three tiers, and, and you will find all of this. The model is based on three tiers, on different tiers, I'm sorry, in which um, across five levels for middle states, and that shows the difficulties or the level of compromise that any substantive change entails. I cannot increase my volume. Okay, this is the, the, the maximum volume, I'm sorry. So um, for those of you who are in the Middle States region and those of you who are in the different other regions, you can always find um, these changes in the website of your own commission for Puerto Rico and the ones in the in the, in the eastern coast that belong to middle states, this is the name of the website in the area in the website that you can call, that you can click on and find what's included in, in the substantive change. But once again, I'm going to go over them. And that's, okay. Once, of, once again, most important aspects to stress. These changes are going to be evaluated on risk. So every change is a risk, and that's what the commissions are going to be looking at. What's the risk if we approve this change for this institution? So that's the evaluation that's going to take place. Second, the types of substantive changes are included in the section 602.22a of the CFR. If anybody if any one of the attendees up to this session wants to verify, please go to CFR section 602.22a, or and the new requirements are also included in section 602.22 section B. I want to give this reference because this is taken from the CFR. This is not from Middle States. This is from the Code of Federal Regulations. So the once again, it mentions that the institutions, it, it mentions something different. This is something different. In this, in this regs, in these new regulations, there's a specification that institutions that have been in non-compliance in any one of the previous three years for any sub-change that they want to submit, they need previous approval by the commission. If the institutions are in good shape and have not been in, in non-compliance in the past three years previous to the date in which they want to submit the sub-change, they simply submit the change. So, I mean, it's a, a two-step process for those who, are, who have been in non-compliance or, or those that ha, do not have at least a provisional certification for participation in Title IV, this is the new process. This was not there before. And the notification is only, only process. Ah, that's a, this, something wrong. That's, that's wrong. Oh, the, if the institution is in compliance, it doesn't have any problems. It simply notifies. OK. This, I'm sorry, these are, this, these are the 14 changes that are part of the process of substantive change right now. And I want to stress on the different types of substantive change and the, what's included in the CFR that makes or calls 
for differences within them. Number one is substantial change in mission or, or objectives. If you are submitting, a, if you are reviewing your mission, your institutional mission, or your objectives, but it's a, it's a semantical process of revision, that's not a substantive change. It will be a substantive change if it's a substantial change, if it goes directly into something that changes who the institution is, how the institution calls itself, what it strives for that's contained in its mission or objectives, then you will submit a sub-change. But if you're changing a word, if you're changing a comma, if you're changing orders, in, in that's not substantive change. So then you wouldn't have to submit a sub-change for the, that change in mission or objectives. You should keep track, though, of, of any changes that the institution suffers throughout its history. So if, the, if your board of directors approves any kind, any kind of change in your mission or objectives, even though it's not a substantive change for middle states, please keep track of all the minutes and all the evidence that, that mention all that change for the institution because it affects the public information that needs to be provided and it's also, that's in, also included in this law, public information and being and being trust truthful with the public is really critical within this processes. Number two, change in legal status, form of control or ownership. That's a complex sub change always. What does this mean? What we what the changing landscape of the higher uh, education panorama in the, in the United States shows is that many institutions might, might, some institutions might not be able to recover after the financial uh, stress that the COVID situation and many other aspects have imposed on those institutions. And there's going to be new considerations probably within the next two or three years of institutions that have weakened, that cannot sustain themselves anymore, and might to go into different arrangements with other institutions. That would be the case for number two, change in legal status, form of control, or ownership, and those are always considered complex of changes. What does that mean? This involves the participation of many other entities beyond our, the, the, the staff of middle states. It goes to legal as consideration, they go to financial experts. So it's that's what makes it complex. But that's important because that's happening and I've seen it happening. I saw it even before I left middle states three weeks ago. There were changes that I would have never thought in my life I would see. And there was they were submitted as as a merger or an acquisition by another institution. And I was really taken by that and, and surprised and really started worrying about how many of our institutions will really survive after all of this. Number three is significant departure from existing educational program. This is not a very frequent sub change, but it comes, it shows once in a while. Um, I've had institutions, for example, I'm going to mention a, an, an example of it. An institution that's approved for master's degree and, and for bachelor's degree, they even offer doctoral degrees. But in the case, they wanted to go into, into a joint venture with, an, with a hospital and start master's programs in health sciences, and they did not have any programs in health sciences at the bachelor's or at the master's level before. Well, that's significant departure from what they did. Of course, they were approved for bachelor's. For the, for the credential level. They were approved for master's, they were approved for doctoral, but not in this discipline. That ha they had to submit a, a, a significant departure uh, sub-change. So this is what this type of uh, title, and this is what this entails. 
Number four is the one that's been the most common, I think, throughout all the years that I went, that I participated in Middle States. It's the alternative delivery method. If if an institution is approved for the for alternative delivery method, distance ed, it means that you had submitted at least for Middle States two programs and they were approved to be taught in distance ed format. After July 1st, after July 1st, in middle states, any institution that had already submitted and, and had approved one program in distance ed is approved from now on for distance ed. So the requirement was reduced from two programs to one, just one. Those institutions that don't have any program approved, and we have many institutions that don't have any program approved for distance ed, need to submit at least one and have it approved, hopefully by this December 31st of this year, in order to be approved for distance ed. It's your risk. If you don't do it, that's perfect. You have been functioning up to this point without that, uh, without having to go through that process. But you know that this, the environment is changing and we don't, we can't foresee what the future brings. So if there's any institution that's not yet approved for an alternative delivery method and distance ed, I would urge you to try to at least submit one program that will bring you to full uh, recognition in, in that aspect. And so it's, it's easier for institutions, it's what I mean. Direct assessment programs did not suffer any change from what has been before. Number six is really important. Under the new regulations, any, is an institution that wants to go from, the, from a level of credential that they are approved to offer to a higher level for which they are not approved to offer, they have to submit sub-changes, at least Two programs at that first at that credential level have to be submitted. That's this is the case. I'll take an, an, an example. An undergraduate institution has approved for let's say just bachelor's levels, and it's approved. But then, if you want to to be approved for master's degree, there you, because that's a higher credential level, you have to submit two programs in order to be fully approved for that credential level. After those two programs are approved at that higher credential level, if you're going to expand and offer many more programs in master's degree, you don't have to go through this process again. But if you are approved for bachelor's and now you want to offer an associate degree because that's a lower credential level, the regulation now doesn't call for a sub change for that purpose. Whereas before, up to June 30, if you went for, if you want, if you were approved for bachelor's degree and wanted to teach, for example, an associate degree, you would have to submit a sub change, not any more. So that's why I, I, I bolded and underlined the word higher because that's the only one that's considered a sub change if it goes from a lower level to a higher level. A change in measure of student progress is something that's different too. Before, an institution could have could teach semester a program in semesters or a program in, in whatever, whichever way they wanted to do it, quarters, uh, five weeks, anyway. Fantastic. Now, if the institution wants is only teaches at with let's say semesters and wants to go from also from semesters to quarters and teach both both at the same time now that requires a sub change the change from semesters to quarters now requires a sub change whereas before it was not required not for middle states at least okay substantial increase in the number of clock hours only if it's more than 25% Decrease if you want to reduce the number of hours that doesn't need a sub change. Up to June 30th, we have to submit if we wanted to, to decrease 
number of hours or increase the number of hours, but not anymore for decreasing, for decreasing the number of hours. Only if you are going to increase, it's then, then you need to submit a sub-change now. Written arrangements, those are the ones that we considered agreements. Uh -huh. Hilda, excuse me, que, eh, Professor Marcos Torres, hola, Professor. He asking if in graduate level or can be, if in graduate level, or it can be one on the graduate and then the other at the graduate level. Uh, for what type of change? I guess the one that you were talking. Number six, higher credential level. Bueno, number six, yes, okay. I yeah. Okay. Marcos, if you are, I mean, if you go to your state uh, status of accredit statement of accreditation status in the Middle States website, it's called SAS. You will find in the in the page for what types of credentials the institution is approved. I don't know specifically your question. If you could be more specific, if you if your institution is approved is approved for bachelors and wants to go higher, you have to submit the sub-change for the first two programs at that higher level. If your institution is graduate only, masters or, or, batch or doctorates, and want to go to offer now bachelor's degrees, you don't have to submit any sub-change because you're going to a lower credential level. I don't know if it helps, but that's the way that it's, um, that we work about it. You can call me. You can uh, you can call me, and then we can talk about that or or email me. Okay. There there is also the the, the written arrangements and the establishment and closures of uh, additional locations. The establishment or closure of branch campuses are considered separate from the additional locations. The relocation and classification of the main campus is considered separate. And if an institution wants to close or needs to close, that is a huge, big subject. Unfortunately, it's happening. And there's also the opportunity, and now the government is very interested in this, in having institutions try what they call experimental sites, initiatives, in which they want to try something that the institution considers to be very innovative and very productive and very eye-opening. So if, if the institution wants to propose one of those, it has to submit a sub-change. But then the CFR now also requires that if an institution wants to change an existing program method of delivery, you and you're already approved for the method of delivery that you're using, you have to notify middle states. That's the last square in this page. If you're going to change the curriculum of any program by at least 25% of that program, 25% or more, you have to notify the accreditation agency. If you're going to create customized pathways, it's allowed. For example, I have at the a, an associate degree in nursing and I want to create a customized uh, pathway in which uh, people who have been uh, medics in the army will uh, are going to be allowed to not have to go through the first year, for example, and just have to go, go can go into the second year. So that's a modified or customized pathway. It has to be notified to middle states. And if there is a written agreement for the provision of one to 24%, of the program by a different institution that's not you and you have been and that's a local program it has to be notified to middle states in the case of middle states these are the ones that i'm talking about i don't know the specifics of the other different um accreditors and i don't even have the time to go into those this is important this is a change so existing sub changes new Requirements are for existing methods of program delivery. So if you're changing from face-to-face to, -face to uh, hybrid, whatever, depends on how many, what's the percentage of the change, it might require a sub-change. Aggregate of the program, development of the customized pathways, 
But then look at this one, I am stating it again, lower credential levels are not considered sub-changes anymore. So if you're going from bachelor's and offering a post-secondary certificate in the same discipline that you have a bachelor's, that's a lower credential level, you don't have to submit a sub-change for that. Sub-changes always require new forms and there are new forms in the websites of all the all the accreditors, please verify them. Don't use anything that doesn't say approved after July 1st or something because it's, prob it's probably, the, it's most probable that you're using the wrong form. So ve please verify. And the different, there's not one form for every subchain, but one for each different one. I'm sorry that I had to rush through this, but I wanted to leave some minutes to go back to your questions. And just note that this is just a big, high, high, high level summary of the effect of all these new regulations. How long will these regulations stay? The ones that are not prompted by COVID will stay. The ones that were prompted by COVID will have a termination date, a sunset clause. Which sunset clause only God knows. We can work with what's in place now. And most of them, the sunset clause says December 31st of this year, but anything can happen. Thank you for your attention. I'm, I can try to answer questions. No Thank questions? You very, Thank you very much. Este, I have to move to my room because in, in my living room, my neighbors were with a lot of noise. So in order Family. to... To keep to keep the recording safe. Uh, uh, any questions in the chat? Oh, I don't know if, if you can unmute your microphone since we are a smaller group. Probably you can. Uh, Carlos. No, just here uh, waiting for any questions uh, that mm -hmm. may come from the audience. Mm -hmm. it's it's overwhelming. 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 I know that it's overwhelming. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and, and you know what's most uh, worrying to me? Mm -hmm. it's, it's when I see small institutions that have not yet really gone through a self-evaluation on how strong are they to face mm -hmm. everything that's so uncertain in the near future. And uh, I wanted you to know, please verify, because there are many alternatives like mergers or joining other institutions because this it's painful when you see an institution that needs to close and we have seen some other institutions will have this they have simply decided not to continue with the accreditation and lose the accreditation but that has an impact on title four for their institute for their students Same. Dr. Definitely. Colon, I wanted to ask you uh, if mm -hmm. you can expand a little bit on <clears throat> that last part that you shared with us about the kind of pre-COVID, post-COVID, and the uh, sunset clause for 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 the sub-change, um, oh. the things that are related to COVID, and then you know the other things that were more uh, perennial because the institution uh, had had done that in the past. Okay. The, anything that's included in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, that's what I, what, the reason why I referred uh, the YouTube section in which that is included in the CFR. That has the probability, the possibility of lasting three, four, five years, as long as they don't call for another revision, or if the Congress people decide to reauthorize the Higher Education Act, fantastic. The ones mm -hmm. that are provided by COVID, by the COVID-19 flexibilities, which are the extension of the permission to operate, even without having submitted any sub-change or a, for permanent approval for remote learning, that expires the third year up to today. I don't know if the secretary will extend it or not, but up to today, it's up to, it's September 30. I mean September December 30. December, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, déjame cancelar mi video para volver al sonido porque. Okay. 
So, I mean, those are important. And the other thing is, okay, so most of this will stay. The difference is how you go about that. Are you going to depend on this temporary approval? And then December 30 comes, January 31st arrives and you are not allowed, you don't have the permission to go remote. What do you do as an institution if you're not approved? So that's a risk that, that you have to, to decide on how to go about that. Este, Hilda, eh, Dr. Catherine Rivera is asking if the presentation can be available for further review. Eh, if you want, we can do, bueno, if you, if you allow us eh, to share through a link so they can download it in a PDF form. Do you, sí, do you sí, por... sí, sí, okay. I, don't, I yeah. don't know if we still need to be in English at all, but um, gracias. Eh, I mean, uh, it's really, this is, I try to use the the least. I try to be very short in this in these slides, and uh, because it's otherwise I would have never ended. I would have drawn 30 slides, and, and so I don't know how useful that this is. But this is the area that I would want you to stress. Please, please, please. Yes, gracias. Que es la sección 602.22 del CFR. That's where the permanent or the most permanent today regulations are contained. Because everything is as permanent as permanent can be in this in this changing world. And, and Dr. Colon, <clears throat> of course, this is this is very dense information because you are compressing, Ooh. of course, uh, I don't know how many volumes of manuals here, but uh, again, it is very good information. I wanted to ask you, uh, you also made a comment in regards to, again, at the end of your of your presentation, in regards to uh, this element of uh, exploring uh, mergers Alternative. and, uh, of course, you know, making sure that uh, we we highlight what we do. Um, I don't know if you are in a in a in a position to to tell us uh, if you happen to have that crystal ball in regards to mergers and and you know what would be the or, or what is the percentage of potential mergers that may happen after covid if if that has been something that you have either uh, discussed in your or read or found before when i when i was still a vice president for institutional field relations in middle states that was up to july 31st i was mesmerized scared weary about the data that I was looking at. I, I used to work with 81 institutions in the United States in this area of the United States. And uh, some of them huge, very powerful research one institutions that have their own huge endowments and have uh, entities by which they generate their own revenues. And that makes them less vulnerable, I'm going to mm -hmm. say less vulnerable to any environmental changes and more increases. This is very Darwinian. I'm sorry, but this is Darwinian. And um, and then I saw the others, the other spe very specialized, very highly focused institutions. Most of them, unfortunately, could be um, local institutions and maybe some small colleges, maybe some faith-based institutions that only had 40 students, 60 students, mm -hmm. 70 students, which makes it very, very, not all of them were faith-based, but I mean, they, I, I, those some were. And, and that would make them really, really um, vulnerable to any kind of situation in which their finances were compromised. And there's also an interesting situation now in which institutions are considering whether they can really open or reopen or partially open for face-to-face -face because the students are questioning and families are questioning and this is not the vice president anymore this is in la colon the, the families are questioning whether they should pay the tuition that's being charged for a partial university or college bound experience because if we sustain that a higher education degree entails much more 
than learning a profession, but it, it because it involves create making you as a sensitive person to multiculturalism and to different um, situations in what well, I mean to, to diversities, all kinds of diversities and open to the futures, flexible, I mean be social, that you can only develop in a social environment. And if you pay this amount of money for a partial uh, proposal, educational proposal, then I mean, people are questioning that. I don't know if that's gonna continue. I hope we can return to some kind of normalcy. I don't know what shape or form that normalcy will have. I know that it's very difficult to try to live, to regain the, to, to relive the past. What's past is past. We have to look into a new future. And that's something that's really worrisome, and that's why I am urging. I, I I was urging my institutions, please review your options. Please look at your options freely. Look at your options or with your own eyes, with your own criteria. Evaluate yourselves within five years under different scenarios. But this is Hilda Colón. This is not Middle States. I mean, that's aside from my experience. I was a president. I know what I'm I'm talking about. I worked with the observatory in Arecibo, so I know what the risks were. And uh, so, I mean, this is very complicated. We were in a, most of us were in a highly comfort zone. It's not there anymore. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yubelki, is anything yeah. around from chat? And no, I just see comments thank, uh, saying thank you, excellent presentation. Thank you for the summary and the explanations and clarifications. So you have been, although it was condensed and short, sure, but you were directly to the point. So thank you so much. And we finish. Please share our, it. Please share it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly on time. So. Now that you allowed us to share the presentation, we will put it in a PDF form. And besides the, the link to the to download the or to access the video, then you will have the link to see the presentation as well. So you have both as reference and feel free to share with everyone. Uh, okay. Uh, any other uh, comments that you may want to say, Hilda, now that you're back in Puerto Rico in your island. We're so pleased. Gracias. No, lo que quiero es decirle gracias a todos. Ustedes no saben la alegría que me da mm -hmm. haber podido conversar con ustedes de este tema que es tan denso y llamarles la atención, por favor, por favor, a todas mm -hmm. las instituciones en, estén donde estén, wherever you are. Just mm -hmm. review your accreditor's website. There are changes. Mm -hmm. And if you are the ALO, or if you're involved in accreditation in any kind of the, in any part of the process, please review it because many things have changed and we all need to be get together in this. Definitely. Yep. And and she, you share at the end, Bella, your information. So you Please. can either contact uh -huh, her uh, directly. If you didn't copy that, you can also ask us. If, and if, if that allows us, we can share uh, then ahí. your information. Yo la puse ahí. OK, perfect. Yeah, but if some, someone doesn't take notes. Sí, seguro. Uh, sí, you seguro. can definitely approach us, and we can put you in contact as well. OK, anytime, and thank anytime. you. Thank you, Jelixa, for being in charge of the chat and, and the recording. And Dr. Morales, our new chair, chairman, that have been very active, very uh, proactive in helping us putting a lot of, all of these webinars and pertinent topics for you to, to to support your efforts and initiative. And please feel free to ch uh, share any idea, any other topic that you may want us to approach and present, please let us know, okay? Remember, next topic will be in Spanish with Tito, Juan Tito Melendez, that I think he was around there in the, in, in the he was your, participating in this, a lot of this as well. So, Tito, you're next. So, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your weekends. The ones who are in Puerto Rico, be safe. There is a storm be coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, also, yeah, besides the COVID and the earthquakes, there another storm. So, please be safe. 
And as soon as we have the available, please check by Monday that the video should be available with a, we, within the presentation, okay? In the same page you register. Tú lo tienes, Ana. así que you have Maybe it. I so have it already. I, you can yes. distribute it from there. And so exactly. I, want, I just um, want to say thank you to everyone who have been so patient and to you, Angelica, mm -hmm. for being so helpful. Thank you, Carlos, yeah. for trusting thank me, you. for trusting me. Definitely. Thank you, Ilda, for your availability and for sharing your, your knowledge and wisdom with, yeah. with the heads of the audience. Gracias. Definitely. And, and as Jelisa put in the chat, for certificates, info at heads.org. Okay, please. Thank Excelente. you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon and weekend. Take Stay care. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Hey, definitely. Bye-bye.